We come to the altar right now, God.
as you wait for the crown and tell the world of the treasure you Father, we just thank you for being in this place and touching our hearts and our lives. Thank you for refreshing our soul. Lord, as we are here gathered together in one place, you are in the midst of our praise and our worship. And so, Father, we give this all to you as a sweet-smelling sacrifice. Father, we just thank you for touching every person in this place. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Hey, uh, this morning, I just want to welcome you, one of the most special, the absolute most special person on the planet to me is uh, my wife, and uh, she is an amazing woman. From the day I met her, she has exuded the love of Christ, and it was really her and her love, her pure love for Jesus that drew me to Christ. And, uh, and she has not stopped leading people to Jesus. And um, it's the love of God in her. And she is passionate about God. She's passionate about uh, women and mothers. And uh, she loves to preach. And she can preach the pain off the walls. So would you welcome my beautiful bride, Pastor Starlene. Thank you. I am super excited. I've got some things on my heart this morning. Um, I want to uh, kick off this time together with someone. I'm going to interview someone who I have known for 26 years. She's been my bud. I met her when I was in Bible school in Oklahoma. And we got, got together and we ended up becoming just, I mean, the first time we got together, we thought we were going to see a movie. We never got to the movie because we couldn't help but keep talking about Jesus and about life and about how excited we were for what God had in store for us. And so over the years, then my husband and I moved back here uh, after Bible school, and uh, then we ended up starting Inspiration Bible Church. And then uh, it was a few years later that her and her husband, Matt, Ended up moving here. Yes, give it up for Aaron Francis. She's shaking her finger. Six years? I know. No, I, there's no way. I know. We're not that old. I know. <laughs> right? We're, we're just young, young things. Yeah. But, you know, we've gotten to do a lot together over the years. This is quite the thing. I know, isn't it? I know. Well, I'm like rolling away from you. How yeah, I know. This? Yeah. Are, are you going to make it? I you could so. jump off and scooch it in. No, I'm good. You're good. I'm okay. Good. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we've done life together. Yeah. And I, I was realizing that a lot of you here, especially if you're new, you don't even realize how much life this girl and I have done together. And uh, 26 years is, is a long time. That's over two decades. Boy, we're getting close to <clears throat> three. <laughs> but we've, we've, uh, we've had highs and lows and everything in between. We've laughed our heads off till we cried, and then we cried for real. I mean, we've done, done life, you know, raised kids, and today's Mommy's Day. And uh, I just, I want to interview her to talk about just some things um, about raising kids, one of them being um, our expectations sometimes. And I think, I know for myself, I've learned a lot over the years that I didn't know when I was a new mom. How many, can, if you're, if you're, if you had older kids, how many can attest that, yeah, there's a few things you wish you could have known, but you just didn't know. So um, when we were in Oklahoma, uh, Vanessa was just a little squirt. And uh, Vanessa was a very strong-willed child, my oldest. 
We went over to her house one time, and I saw um, she was upstairs with Vanessa putting her to bed, and I walk in the kitchen, and there's a thick stack of books, and all the spines were out, and it's like how to raise a strong-willed child, how to keep your sanity while raising the strong-willed child, how to still be a Christian after raising the strong-willed child. I mean, it was just, I was like, okay, I guess I know what's going on here. Vanessa is amazing. She is. Just had a little gauntlet to go through. Yeah, we had a gauntlet, and we got through that gauntlet, and tell them real quick what Vanessa did recently. Well, yes, last week, um, first off, uh, it was awesome to watch, you know, from afar. We were in Phoenix, Arizona. She um, got her master's degree in professional counseling, and if you know her story, that's a miracle in itself. And not only did she graduate, but she graduated at the top of her class. Yeah. And... Uh, I guess the books paid off. Yeah, the books paid off. You know, which leads me into a question that I want us to talk about. And in raising children, sometimes there are challenges. And one of them we share, and that is that we both raised, well, first off, we both raised strong-willed children. And then, I mean, she was laughing at me until she had one of her own. I can't ever tease her or laugh about anything because then it, I, God doesn't send it to me. I just walk through the same thing. Oh, man, if we had time, I would tell him the first time that happened to me. Okay, so <laughs> she was talking to someone. Now, don't, don't listen. She was talking to someone at church, and one of her children accidentally being a little baby, you know, one-year-old, unzipped her top while she was talking to the person. And I thought that was the funniest thing ever. I'm like, oh, my gosh, that is so She funny. just let out one of my most funny. embarrassing oh moments my gosh, that in is life. So funny. Oh, I feel so sorry for you. You know, oh, I'm so sorry. Like, one year later, my child did it to me. And I'm like, that is not funny. Why are you laughing? That is not funny. You know, I don't know that I even do that. Huh. Wow. Okay, so anyway, both of us also shared that as we were going through life, we discovered that our, our children had some learning disabilities. That's partly why I said that my oldest was the top of the class, getting our master's is God, um, because honestly, I, I had her evaluated in high school by a professional doctor, and the doctor said uh, the best she's going to be able to do is maybe just a community college, a couple classes here and there. There is no way she can handle a university. Um, that was a very devastating time in our life, and we had to dig in deep and had to decide that God's word was bigger than man's word, even if they had all these letters behind their name. We had a very similar situation. Um, our child um, was told that she would never read past a fifth grade level. Um, high school is going to be very difficult for her. College would never, ever be an option. And today she's in the Marine Corps. You know, you just, I you just knew, know. Matt and I knew when we walked out of that particular, you know, she was eight years old, seven, when that was said over her. And when we walked out of that, we knew that was going to be her testimony. And this morning she said, Mom, please share how difficult it was, those moments, but how prayer and God has gotten me through it. And then today what God has done. You know, when we were talking about this, you shared with me something that I really want you to share with them. And that is some of the how-to's. Um, some, some moms might be right listening to us or sitting here in the thick of just a couple things that we mentioned. And no matter what you're in the middle of raising kids, even if your kids are grown. Honestly, I think uh, having grown kids is a trickier thing that no one ever even, no one talks about that. We've Seriously. asked, like, would we want to be warned how difficult it is? I mean, it's great having grown kids. It's don't absolutely wrong. fabulous. But, like, you know, having to... Uh, so much to navigate. Exactly. And so I'm like, I don't think I really would have... I'm good not knowing. Yeah. I'm glad I just... <laughs> You're glad you were oblivious to it till it happened? <laughs> well, in all that, you shared with me something, and it, it still, even whether they have little kids or they have... Are they're in the thick of challenging teenage years or they have grown children 
the nugget that you, we talked about is something that's going to apply to all. So when my oldest was two, um, I was like, I was a stay-at-home mom, and I was like, oh, Father, help me. What do I do? I've, I've said no 10,000 times today, and it still is just not really working. And so um, he said to me, go to her doorpost when she's asleep, either nap time or bedtime, and pray for her. And I was like, okay, I'll do that. And so um, at bedtime, I did that for her. And um, the next morning, just for a few minutes, not even, you know, big, long time. The next morning when she woke up, she just was like so quick to respond to me. And the love between us was amazing. And I was like, whoa, that was like secret sauce stuff. Thank you, God. <laughs> and then um, it waned after, oh, four or five days. It started getting kind of the same as it was before. So I did it again. And um, I'm like, okay, I am not letting go of that secret sauce. And the, not only would I stand at her doorpost, but I would confess things over her. I would get scriptures. Um, it wouldn't be this big, long thing. And then um, I would also pray in the spirit because there were times I didn't know what to pray, especially as they age. You don't always know what to pray or you don't know what's coming down the pike. And I would stand there and pray over them. And to this day, I still do it. My children are grown and um, I still, you know, you can grab a picture or stand at a doorpost and there is actually scripture in the Old Testament about, you know, how they put the blood on the doorpost. And um, the Jewish faith, they actually have this little, I don't know the name of it, this little thing they actually put onto the doorpost and they put written prayers down in there. I didn't know any of that when the Lord had told me this. So there really is a scriptural standard for it. So, so, so good. Um, you know, as I'm going to be moving into the message, I'm going to talk about what expectations that sometimes God's plan looks different than what we had imagined in our brain. Oh, no. We know exactly what our kids are going to do. <laughs> um, I know for me personally, I had things in my brain that what it looked like for them as adults. And I had to work through that my ways are not his ways. And that God sees the big picture, and God sees even a better plan than what I could even fathom or think or drum up in my mind or think I knew. And it's been exciting to unfold, but also challenging, because at the moment when you're going through it, you're challenged to the core. And uh, we're, I'm going to share later on some stories from the Bible of where that is the case, but, you know, Aaron, do, do, can you relate to that at all? Is that, is that bear witness with you? Do you think, did you have everything all figured out when they were little? Yeah, of course oh, I did. Of course, yeah, I stood we at all their did. doorpost and prayed. I told right. God what they were going right. to do, and he's yeah. like, yeah, right. Yeah. Um, my biggie was when our youngest said she wanted to be a Marine. Um, I love the military. My family has always been extremely patriotic and supportive of the military. Um, but because we birthed daughters, because I birthed daughters, I had completely taken the military off um, the shelf in my mind that that would even be an, op an option. And um, it was such a beautiful story of how God walked her to that realization of that that was the call in her life. And um, I'm just going to be completely honest. I cried for three months. And um, I told Matt, please don't discuss how I'm dealing with this for a little bit till I get my traction, till I get this under my feet. And um, it was, we, her and I had become very close, and I knew that, you know, this wasn't like going away to college. I knew I wasn't going to get to pop in or, you know, you know, I knew it was going to be very permanent. And so I, I had to grieve um, that, but also the um, realization of the call on my child's life was bigger than what I had at that moment. Um, and so I had to step in. I had to allow God to really prune my love, my mother's love that had very um, definite expectations of what our grown family was going to look like. And I had to allow him to really prune me. And that was the, the crying. And not, not ridiculous sobbing or anything. And I always told her, I support you. She came to me one time, is the crying because you're not peaceful? I went, oh, no, 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 no. I'm perfectly peaceful. This is growing pains because my heart is so full of love, it's seeping out of my eyes. And then I would just wipe it away and go, but we're good. You do this. We're doing this. I'm growing to where you already are. 
And I think that's a big thing with uh, grown children. There's times you have to grow to where, where they are already, and that's a, wow. Well, that's a really good statement right there. Um, you know, I, I know that when I had the realization that, well, first, my first daughter was going to live in Arizona, and now my second daughter lives in Arizona, and this is actually my first Mother's Day without my daughters, and, um, but I'm doing good. You know why? Because I have learned how to trust completely in my Abba, Heavenly Father, who gives me what I need at every time. Um, but yes, I, I'm like you. I had to work through a few things. I, I'm not going to deny that my eyes got leaky quite a few times myself when the realization of what I thought in my brain, I mean, honestly, I just thought when they were little and honestly, they were running around here, you know, hey, they're going to get married and they're still going to run around here. But God saw a bigger plan. Does that make sense? And I think sometimes as parents, especially if you are a grandparent or have grown children in this room, sometimes we have to take the realization of God sees the bigger picture. Those of you listening and watching me right now, God sees the bigger picture. Don't get hung up with what, what's going on right now. God's got it. God's got it. God's got a better plan. And, you know, back to the strong-willed children, um, both both our children are doing amazing. They serve God. They love God. We, we are so grateful to the Lord for that. I know your, your girls are the same way, and I'm just um, dumbfounded at God's faithfulness. God is faithful. And, you know, a verse that I think both you and I cling to is, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. No, I white-knuckled. I will be a joyful mother of children. <laughs> I white-knuckled it because I couldn't get pregnant. And then once I got pregnant, I white-knuckled it because I'm like, joy. I will have joy. And I Amen. did. I did. Amen. He was always so good to help us. And, and another verse that you know that I clung to was children are a delight. When I found yes. that in the Bible, that set me free. We're making them sound horrible. They, they were <laughs> so fun. I think, you know, our four girls were just they're crazy full of life. Yes. You know, they just yes. want to run with their hair on fire, and they yes, just want they to go. Yes, they did. I mean, are they not their fathers? Uh, my, my daughter literally, yes, they are their fathers. <clears throat> my daughter really did one time set her hair on fire. That's why I, I laughed. Oh, I forgot she about really that did. one. Yeah. I'm not going to laugh like because I smell mine burn, never did I smell that. Something's, something's burning. Oh, oh my actually, word, her hair's on fire. Actually, mine did, blowing out a birthday candle. Yes, that's true. Yep. Yep. Okay. <laughs> well, Aaron, I'm going to move on to, to Naaman. Do you want me to help you preach the rest of your sermon? You already told it to me, and it is I, good. <laughs> you want me to go sit down so I'll shut up, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Can you please give it up for Aaron Francis? You. you know what? You can get rid of both these chairs because I'm going to preach standing up. So I do want us to go in our Bibles we're going to 2 Kings chapter 5. While you're going there, can we just make the devil more nervous as we're bringing out Bible stories? Let's get them in the, let's get them in the air. Say, this is my Bible. I can have what the Word of God says I can have. I can do what the Word of God says I can do. And I am what the Word of God says I am. Holy Spirit, do what you do best. May the word of God come alive. May our hearts be good ground. May you speak to each one of us here and each one that is listening by the sound of my voice. I give you praise in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay. We are going to talk about a man named Naaman. Naaman was, uh, he was a great commander of the army. He was actually the commander. He was top dog. He was in charge. We're going to pick up in, in verse 1 of chapter 5. So 2 Kings 5, 1 says, The king of Aram had great admiration for Nahum, the commander of his army. Because through him the Lord had given Aram great victories. But, through, but though Naaman was a mighty warrior, he suffered 
from leprosy. If you don't know what leprosy is, it was, it's not so uh, talked about today. It's not so prevalent because we have learned a lot of solutions to leprosy over the, the years. But back then, it was extremely contagious. Boy, does that sound familiar? <laughs> extremely contagious. And it was sores all over your body that would make you itch and you were miserable with leprosy. Leprosy was so severe that you would lose limbs from leprosy. So here's this great man in charge of the army, and yet he has leprosy. We're going to, um, I'm going to jump down to verse 9. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and waited at the door of Elisha's house. I skipped some verses where he went to the king. The king said, Hello, I'm not God. I can't take care of you. And then the prophet steps in. He goes, the prophet says, I know God. So here he is. He's going to Elisha's house. Verse 10. But Elisha sent a messenger out to him with this message. Go and wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River. Then your skin will be restored and you will be healed of your leprosy. But Naaman became angry and stalked away. I thought he would certainly come out to meet me, he said. I expected him to wave his hand over the leprosy and call on the name of the Lord his God and heal me. Aren't the rivers of Damascus, the Abana, the Parpar, I just said it wrong, but anyway, bear with me. Better than any of the rivers of Israel. Why shouldn't I wash in them and be healed? Wait a minute. Why is he upset that he's having to go to the Jordan? The Jordan was extremely muddy and gross. Ever looked at a lake or an area where there might be good fishing, but you know I'm not going swimming in that. I'm not putting anything in that. That's what he was dealing with. And here you got a man who's like, I'm the commander of the army. Hello, my dignity does not want to get in a muddy, disgusting, gross river. So, verse 13, but his offers tried to reason with him and said, Sir, if the prophet had told you to do something very difficult, wouldn't you have done it? Does this sound like any pride here? His pride said, I am a great man. If you ask me to do something really tough and hard, I can do that. But get in a muddy river and just dunk seven times? That's disgusting. I'm above that. So so here's his his, uh, officers. So you should certainly obey him when he says simply, go and wash and be cured. Verse 14. So they talked him into it. So Nahum went down to the Jordan River, and he dipped himself seven times. As the man of God had instructed him, and his skin became as healthy as the skin of a young child, and he was healed. I think Christians sometimes, <laughs> we suffer from short, short-term memory loss. Because I have noticed we get a few victories in our life, and then we start judging someone else who has goofed up, has flipped out, has done something in the flesh, and we get all upset at them, and we forget where we have fallen short. I've noticed this. I've walked with God, okay, I hate to say this, but a few decades, many years, and I've seen this history repeat itself so much I can't even count somebody gets delivered somebody gets set free and they're excited about it but then as soon as somebody else trips their finger just goes out you know my husband taught me something that when we point a finger how many are pointing back at us at least three sometimes four there's there's we forget where we've come from We forget. We we have short-term memory loss. Come on. So here here we have a man, Nahum, who he kind of went off. 
I mean, he went off at the great prophet of God and was like, no, I'm better than this. I, can, I, I deserve to at least do it in a clean river. I deserve more than this. You know, he got in his flesh. His flesh thought more of his dignity. I mean, you, you got to realize this guy had officers under him. This would be like, okay, it, let me just put this in our terminology. This would be like the president of the United States being told, if you just go dunk seven times in the mud, wouldn't we all be like, <gasps> But I'm telling you, sometimes God has an interesting way of restoring and healing us. You know, I look at the Holy Spirit that God sent to us. And the Holy Spirit sometimes does things in very odd ways that we can't even explain. But you know what? I am so in love with him, I don't care. And if my dignity sometimes is not all there, I don't care. I hope you heard me. I meant that. I'm not concerned about my dignity. I'm concerned about getting my victory. And if it sometimes means I got an ugly cry, I don't care. If you're going to judge me that I ugly cry, go ahead. If it might mean that I'm plastered on the floor, I don't care. I'm going to get my victory. I'm going to get everything that the Holy Spirit wants to give to me. Because his plan is bigger than my plan. See, I can, I can reason everything out, even in motherhood. I can reason everything out of how I think everything should go, and I have. I'm a planner. How many know that I'm a planner? If you know me, you know I have a year in advance calendar. That's how I operate. I, I got to plan everything out. But sometimes God mixes that up. When I was raising children... He mixed a lot of things up because he had a better plan. And in the midst of him mixing some things up, did I cry some tears in a pillow? Yes, I did. Did I sometimes go, this hurts like crazy, God? Yes, I did. But God has a bigger, better plan. You know, I, I used to think they'll grow up and do X, Y, and Z. <laughs> You might be here thinking, I thought this. I thought they'd say thank you for that. I thought I'd get picked for this. Come on. I thought they would spend more time with me. I thought, I mean, the list goes on. I don't care if you're a mom in this room or not. I don't care if you're a single person. I don't care if you're a child. All of this applies to you. Your thoughts are different than God's thoughts. Isaiah 55, verse 8 says, For my thoughts, that's God, are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. Can I get an amen? God sees things you cannot see. So Naaman went off, and I'm going to say something that I, you might want to write down. Naaman went off because he didn't go in. I'm going to say it again. Naaman went off because he didn't go in. We go off when we don't go in to the presence of God. You lose your cool. You lose your, your radical thinking of God is bigger than this. You lose it all when you don't go in. And what I mean by that is now that Jesus has come and the veil has been torn, we have the privilege of going in to the very presence of God. And when you go in, you're going to find that you go off a whole lot less. If you are someone who loses your temper with your children, then I'm challenging you. It is time for you to go in. Go into the presence of God. Now, 
I know that when my kids were little, I used to try and tiptoe out of my bed so I could have time with God before they woke up. And I swear they had bionic ears. They could hear when my foot hit the ground. You know what you got to learn to do? You got to learn to open your eyes and say hello to the Holy Spirit laying flat, moms. Because if your kids had bionic ears like mine, that's what you got to do. You got to start talking to God while you're still laying in bed because literally I, I would be as quiet as I could. But they just knew. I mean, I couldn't even get to the, as soon as I went to the bathroom, and, I mean, most of us got to go to the bathroom before we even have time with God. I, I give you that. I'd be going to the bathroom and boom, here they are, or, or mom. And I'd be like, I just wanted God time and a cup of coffee. If you're there, I'm so sorry. I know what that feels like. But God, but God. Second Kings, we're back to chapter 5. I'm going to go to verse 13. He said, if the prophet had told you to do something great, wouldn't you have done it? So you should certainly obey when he says simply to... <laughs> If you consider yourself a great man or a woman of God, can you do the simple things? Can you? Can you do the simple? Some of us, you know, you've walked with God like me for years. But are you doing the simple things? Let me talk about those simple things. Are you forgiving? I had to go there. Do you forgive? Now that, you're going, that's not simple. But actually it is. It is simple. We make it hard. We make it complicated. Honestly, forgiveness, even when you've been hurt to the core, is actually a simple thing. Do we spend time with him? Do we pray? Do we talk to God? That is simple. But you're going, oh, but that's not simple if you know my schedule. No, but it is simple. It is simple. You can do it. You know, many times when you start obeying God, you don't see immediate effects of change. And this is going to go right with Keith Hahn's offering today. Don't you love it how the Holy Spirit does that all together? You might be believing. He was believing God for a harvest on his offerings, and he hadn't seen it yet. And God just promptly told him, uh, what about patience? When you are doing some of these things for God that are even simple things and you start obeying God, you may not see the results in the time frame you want them. There are things that I had to believe God for that took longer than I wanted. Anybody had to believe God and it took longer than you wanted? But my God, but God, I heard that one today too. God has a big butt. But God, Hebrews 10, 36 says, for you have need of endurance so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the what? The what? The promise. Do you know that to receive the promises of God, it's going to take some digging your heels in. It's going to take some endurance. It's going to take some believing in God. It's going to take some praying at the doorposts of your children. It's going to take saying, I'm going to believe scriptures over my kiddos. I'm going to pray in the spirit. I'm going to believe God. Patience and endurance to believe the promises of God. Hebrews 11, 1 says, now faith that is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You may not see it. Mama's in the room. You may not see it right now. But you keep your heels dug in. You keep praying. You keep doing the simple things. I don't know. You know, Naaman had to go in a muddy river. I'm not saying that's what you have to do. But what I am saying is do the simple things. It was a simple thing. Dip seven times. Sometimes God's saying, can you just be faithful to meet me in the morning? Can you be faithful to talk to me and get in my presence? Come on, dig your heels in. Have the faith to believe. Have the faith. You know, I believe that 
having the faith for our children or what, or maybe it's a job you're believing for or whatever you're believing God for, and you stir up that faith. You may not see that job right now, but God's, God's working on your behalf. He's working and doing things behind the scenes. And all you got to do is keep being faithful and trust in him. Now, be open that it may look different. And that's what Aaron and I touched on. I had to learn that what I thought was the plan, God's plan might look a little different. And that's hard on our flesh. Our flesh sees it this way. And God says, oh, but I got a better plan than that. Can you just trust me? I got, a, I got, I got something different. And when we are open to say, okay, God, I trust you no matter what. Now, I'm, I, I want to be really, really clear here. I'm not talking about the specific things in the word of God that you got to dig your heels in and say, this is what you've already said. Let me be really even more clear. I am not referring to healing, which is already in the word of God that, that it says is ours. I'm not talking that you should be blessed because that's already in the word of God. I'm not talking that your every need should be provided for, that God will take care of you. He's already said those things about you. Are, you. are you following me? If his word says it, then you dig your heels in and you say, this is what you said. And you tell him, this is your word, not mine. Okay? That's when you get that, this is what you said, God. And he goes, okay. And he responds to that. And that's called faith. But I'm talking about the things that you, are, you can't say are in the word of God. For instance, where you're going to work. For instance, what career your, your child's going to have or, or who they're going to marry. or I mean, the list goes on and on that are not listed in the Bible. Are you following me? And when you are consecrated to God and when you say, God, this is not what I expected, but I'm going to trust that you have a better plan. God loves it when we do that. Loves it. You know, I couldn't help but think of Palm Sunday how the Jews were all praising Jesus, and really they were excited because they thought Jesus was going to deliver them from the Roman tyranny. They thought this was going to be the king of the Jews that was going to set them free from, I mean, they'd forever been in, you know, constraints. It had just happened to be the Romans when Jesus came. And on Palm Sunday, they thought, Praise, this is, this is the Messiah who's going to save us from it all. And a week later, it didn't look like what they thought. When it didn't look like what they thought or what they expected, they turned on him. I'm telling you, church, when it doesn't look like what you thought, it is not the time to turn on him. It is the time to embrace him and say, you got a bigger, better plan. I don't understand it all, but I trust you. There have been times in my life when I've had to say those words to my Abba Father. I don't understand it all, but I do know that there is always a better plan, and I'm going to trust you even when I don't understand. When I was uh, coming back from, I was on the plane coming back from Phoenix, Arizona. I was sitting next to a gentleman. I had Pastor Greg on this side, and I had a stranger on this side. And I was, you know how you get all your stuff out, and you're getting ready to get cozy, and you're getting ready to either kind of rest your eyes or read your book that you've been longing to read. And this gentleman on my other side started a conversation and I am a friendly person, as you know, and we started talking, and we, we ended up talking for at least an hour of that flight. Came to find out he was a Jew. And I, when we, I say we talked, I'm saying we talked about God. And in the conversation, he said, you know, I think that you and I might agree on a lot in fact, I, I think Jews and Christians probably believe on most everything the same. I think there's one thing we differ on, 
and that is that I don't necessarily believe that Jesus was the Messiah. But he said, however, I love the howevers. He's like, you've given me a lot to think about. He said, you know, I have two cousins. So this, 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 this was a businessman, had a home in Arizona, has a home in Canada, and has a home in Israel, a wealthy Jew. And he said, I have grew up in Israel. And he said, I have cousins who they've accepted what you're talking about. They've accepted that Jesus was the Messiah. And they keep trying to tell me that I should. And he said, but I, I just need a little more time to think about this. His name is Donnie. And I am believing that I'm going to see Donnie in heaven. I didn't get to lead Donnie in the sinner's prayer because Donnie wasn't quite ready, but he's right there. And I knew in my heart, Donnie, you're going to talk to your cousins another time. And this one-hour conversation that we've had is going to all come back to you. I sowed a seed that I know is going to get watered when he meets with his cousins. may not look to the Jews like what it was supposed to. The Messiah didn't look like what they thought because God's ways are not our ways. His plan was bigger than just saving them from the Romans. His plan was, I'm going to save the whole world. I'm going to die for the sins of everyone, not just Jews, but Gentiles. My plan goes way beyond what your thinking is. You want me to come in on a white horse, and you want me to set you free from the Romans, but I'm going to set you free from everything and anything and the chains and the addictions and the depression. I'm going to set you free from it all and the, the healing that you need. I got it all wrapped up. You can't see it, but I got a bigger plan. I got a bigger plan. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want you to stand to your feet, Joe, if you could join me. Holy Spirit, I thank you. You're in this room. Oh, Holy Spirit, come on, get alone with God right now. If you are needing to get right with God this morning, If you're needing to get right with God, don't waste another minute. Oh, I beg of you. I beg of you. Get right with God. Get right with God. Those hearing me, watching me, why are you putting it off? Come on, just get right with God. It's really quite simple. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And then you're going to start this amazing journey. This amazing journey. Whether you're a mom today on Mom's Day. Don't you want to do it with God's help? I beg of you. My husband always counts to three, so I'll do it. On the count of three, you need to get right with God. I want you to lift your hands towards heaven. One. You need him. Number two, don't waste another minute. Number three, raise your hands. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, those watching and hearing my voice, can we repeat this prayer? Heavenly Father, come on, all of you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the blood of Jesus that forgives me where I have fallen short of your best. I ask today that you would be not only my Savior, but Lord of my life, completely in charge. I surrender it all, and I thank you. My sin is washed away because of the blood of Jesus. I am clean. I am righteous. I am a new creation in Christ. Old has passed away. All has become new. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want you to. Thank you, honey. I know. I 
cry when I feel God. I, I woke up this week before my alarm, and I mean, I woke up hearing the song I'm about ready to sing. And it was so loud and so beautiful. And I knew, I already knew I was preaching this Sunday by myself. And I knew God was asking me to sing this song. And it was written many years ago, back in 1972, by a man named Andre Crouch. And I knew God was asking me to sing this song. Because here's why. When you have expectations that they're kind of like unmet, and the way you thought God would do it is different than the way God did it, here's what he wants from you. He wants your praise. He wants you to glorify him. He wants your trust. He wants your thanks. And this song incorporates all of that. It's called To God Be the Glory, or you might also know it as My Tribute. I got to blow my nose because I'm ugly crying up here. Hang on. the things you have done for me, things so undeserved, yet you prove to give your love for me, the voices of a million
Wow, what a beautiful message. Thank you, sweetie. How many got something out of today's message? <clears throat> Amen. Let me help you down here. You know, a couple things that we can take home today, especially moms that uh, have little children. Uh, don't wear a zipper blouse to church. A little wisdom right there. Uh, if you got toddlers in your home, uh, battery-operated candles are a good thing. Kids' hair won't go on fire. But there's some secret sauce that was shared today. And it applies to everybody that we go to God. He's got bigger shoulders to carry some things that we don't expect, some things we don't know, our hopes and our dreams. Pray over our children. Pray over our families. It's not so secret that people can't do it. It's, it's only secret if you don't do it. The thing that we've got to learn, too, is to not have pride that we think we know it all, but to humble ourselves. Give God the rest. And the Bible says he will exalt us. God's ways are not our ways. And that's just having that confidence. That's having the expectation that God will come through no matter what. Everyone say that. God will come through. Amen. Patience and faith are simple things. Be faithful. Last thing that I got out of this is just hope. The original language defines hope as a confident expectation. Have a confident expectation that God's got you. God's got your kids. Sometimes it doesn't seem like it. Sometimes like, hey, whoa, my kids. But it doesn't matter. Have your confidence in God's ability. My brother told me something one time, and I just kind of like, oh, yeah. He goes, Greg, you remember what a dirty, rotten, sinning scoundrel you used to be? Remember when you were doing, right in the middle of doing this and that and the other thing? It's like, yeah, why are you bringing that up? He goes, well, if God's got the ability to get a hold of you while you're right in the middle of your sin and then make you a pastor, don't you think God can get a hold of other people who are doing some stupid stuff too? Yeah, God's awesome. So have a confident expectation in God's ability, not your ability. Amen? Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the truth gold we receive today. And Lord, may we not just be hearers only, but may we be doers of the simple things you've laid out for us to do. Dip seven times. Read our Bible. Have confidence in you. Pray. Seek your face. So, Father, thank you for this church who are not hearers only, but they put the word into practice. There is action behind this message today, and we will see the rewards, and we will have a confident expectation that you will come through. Thank you, Lord. Bless your people. Bless the moms as we go our way today. In Jesus' name, amen. One last thing. If you enjoyed today's message, you can uh, listen to it all through the week. You can share it. You can like it online. There are a bunch of other messages. A lot of people don't know this. There's several devotionals that go on throughout the week online at inspirationbiblechurch.com and uh, the app and Facebook and YouTube. So uh, great messages just to encourage you and just help you get through your day. Watch those. Like them. Share them. Comment even. Comment is good. Uh, so God bless you. Have a great week.